Read to Lead podcast, episode 31. Hi, I'm Liz Weisman, author of the book Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. And one way to do that is to encourage everyone to listen to Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Remember, you can't always accomplish everything on your own. You get your ego out of the way uh, and get the help. I think all of us need some mentors. All of us can be mentors to other people. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Thanks so much for making your way back to the Read to Lead podcast. means a lot to me that you make time for this each and every week. Today's episode marks a first. We have not one, but two authors in the guest chair today. One of them, very well known for a book called The One Minute Manager, a book that has sold millions of copies over the years. I'm talking about Ken Blanchard, He, along with Tim Karen, have written a book called Fit at Last, Look and Feel Better Once and for All. Now, if you're anything like me, for years you've been making resolutions and promises about becoming physically fit. Despite all your good intentions, somehow it never quite goes according to plan. But Ken and Tim argue you can break that cycle. Using the tools discussed today and in the book, you'll be able to move from simply being interested in fitness to making a lasting commitment, one that could radically change your life. You see, Ken and Tim argue that following through on your efforts to get fit requires leadership, personal leadership. Ken realized early on the same concepts he'd been using for years to help people lead organizations also could help him stick to his program and do so for the first time after several failed efforts. Here we'll learn how Ken and Tim applied what Ken calls the situational leadership to approach to set smart goals, diagnose Ken's development levels in each of the six core areas of fitness, and match them with the leadership styles necessary to get Ken to the next level in each area. And while fitness is indeed the context for our conversation today, I think you'll quickly realize that these principles apply no matter what your goal. One quick programming note, there is an outside chance, it's not certain, but an outside chance there will not be an episode on Tuesday, February the 4th. Bandwidth for me, quite honestly, has been at a premium here as of late as I prepare for Podcaster Academy, this class that I'm teaching in February. And so I've not been able to keep up with my reading quite as much as I would like. I'm still attempting to secure an interview before this week is over with a couple of different authors and hope to rectify that before Tuesday. But just in case, I wanted to let you know there's an outside chance there won't be an episode next week. That would be the first Tuesday that I've missed, and it pains me to even say that out loud. Hopefully, I'll be able to come through for you before it's all said and done. And speaking of Podcaster Academy, I'd like to add that there are just four slots available for this February course that kicks off Thursday, February 6th. If you'd like to grab one of those four slots and to find out more information, it's readtoleadpodcast.com slash academy. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash academy. As I mentioned earlier, we have co-authors on the show today, Tim, Karen, and Ken Blanchard. Tim has been in the health and fitness industry for more than 50 years. His interest in strength training helped him become a standout high school athlete and took him to the University of Arizona on an athletic scholarship. After graduation, Tim began a career as an Army officer, where his fitness expertise led to a graduate degree from Indiana University, my alma mater, and subsequent assignment to the Physical Education Department at the United States Military Academy. Army's new football coach at the time, NFL coaching legend Lou Saban, recognized Tim's talents and made him the team's strength and conditioning coach, a position Tim held for six years. In 1984, Tim expanded his fitness resume by becoming the fitness director at the Houston Clinic in Columbus, Georgia. Few people have influenced the day-to-day management of people and companies more than Ken Blanchard, a prominent, sought-after author, speaker, and business consultant. Ken is universally characterized by his friends, colleagues, and clients as one of the most insightful, powerful, and compassionate individuals in business today. Ken is one of the most influential leadership experts in the world and is respected for his years of groundbreaking work in the fields of leadership and management. Ken is co-founder and chief spiritual officer of the Ken Blanchard Company, 
Companies, an international management training and consulting firm that he and his wife Margie Blanchard began in 1979 in San Diego, California. In addition to being a renowned speaker and consultant, Ken also spends time as a visiting lecturer at his alma mater, Cornell University, where he is a trustee emeritus of the Board of Trustees. Ken and Tim, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. We're so excited to have you here today. Well, good. It's good to be with you. Great to be with you, Jeff. Ken, I'll start with you. Uh, if you would, share a bit about this seesaw nature of your journey to, to better health and, and what was different about it this time than the other times uh, that, that enabled you to truly commit? Well, Jeff, I think uh, I was like a lot of other people. I would make a New Year's resolution. You know, I'm going to get myself in shape this year and all that kind of thing. And uh, what I finally realized is that the reason New Year's resolutions don't work is that you announce them and everybody important in your life says, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> and they go to a delegating leadership style. And I've been teaching leadership for a long time. And if uh, you could handle a delegating leadership style, it wouldn't be a New Year's resolution. You would do it. <laughs> and uh, so what I realized is that if I was really going to become fit and not this up and down thing where I would announce something and for a month or so do it and all, I really had to get uh, with it. And that's when I went to Tim, who had seen me seesaw for years, and said, Tim, I, I really need a different leadership style. I need your commitment to guide me in this journey. Uh, so uh, that was, that's where it all began. Tim, what was that like for you, having, having Ken as a client all those years and seeing him start the process, but then uh, sort of stumbling uh, a number of times? Well, it was, it was always difficult, Jeff. Uh, I think more than anything, uh, you know, I had at the time, uh, I had a business to run, which involved uh, actually working with uh, many clients. And of course, I was always very anxious to see Ken when he would come in, uh, usually on or about February 1st every year, and, and we'd get a great head start in the program for probably uh, six or eight weeks, and just about the time Ken would really make progress, he'd get uh, really busy and, and get back on the road, and, and of course I had a business to attend to and many other clients, and, and uh, what happened really with that, I think more than anything, is uh, in following the situational leadership model is you know, I would do a great job of, of directing and teaching uh, in the first part, and then I would do a good job of coaching, but what happened uh, is the follow-up and the support would kind of uh, fall to the wayside as, uh, you know, Ken got back to work and, and I got back to work, and uh, then you just kind of let things slip, and then next year kind of start the same thing all over again. So that's that's kind of the way it was. It was difficult, but that's the way uh, business was, and, of course, it wasn't until we – uh, recently had the right reasons, uh, which we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Yeah, in the book, Ken and Tim lay out the six principles of a successful health and fitness program, which really are applicable to to any goal you're going after. And they start with having compelling reasons and a purpose. Guys, why is this so important? Well, you know, you just can't sort of say, I'm going to do something. If it's not important, you're not going to do it. And so you uh, can start with a compelling reason. And Initially, all of my reasons were external with my family, and I wanted to be around to see my grandkids graduate from school and, and my dog that I, <laughs> that I loved and didn't want him to miss me. And, you know, until I realized, and Tim pushed me, that, that the real motivation, Tim, didn't have to, had to come from me. Yes, uh, I think that was the most important thing, because, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why Ken and I uh, did not succeed in the previous years is uh, usually uh, Ken's purpose he'd come in, uh, you know, was uh, because, uh, you know, his wife felt he needed to do it and his son and daughter felt that he needed to do it and, and his business wanted him to be there. And and uh, Ken felt he was he was doing fine. And so uh, he didn't really have that inner motivation to drive. And so uh, having a very distinct purpose became very important. And of course, uh, I think, uh, as Ken finally realized when we uh, got together in, in uh, October of 2010 that this had to be a year-round full-time commitment. And uh, in order to make that work, that purpose really had to, to come within and be one that uh, he wanted to achieve for himself. Well, that leads us right into the next uh, of these six principles, establishing a mutual commitment to success. In other words, we can't do it alone. We need a partner. What's the best way to determine, guys, who that person should be in your life? Well, you know, uh, 
Jeff, at first this, you have to recognize, which Tim really helped me, that there's six parts of or aspects of being healthy. One is aerobic, which is about your heart, and I have a recumbent bike now in my uh, in our bedroom, and I get on it on a daily basis. Uh, there's strength training, there's balance, flexibility, a diet, uh, I mean nutrition and, and weight control, and then rest. And so what you need to do is find out where you are in each of those in terms of your own development level and where you kind of need help, and that's where you need to get it. So, uh, so for example, in the uh, weight uh, and nutrition area, I, I have been a me- member of Weight Watchers for a long time and off and on and all that kind of thing, but I realized that I needed closer supervision. So that's when I got involved with Metafast, where you know, you not only weigh in, but they have a counselor that you meet with and you have the same counselor every week and they go over what you've been eating and you get much closer supervision. So it's a it's a matter of uh, finding the right people. And so Tim helped as my head facilitator get me the right people in different areas where maybe it wasn't his expertise. I think uh, establishing that mutual commitment uh, uh, on my behalf, you know, Ken was interested in... Uh, you know, what it would take for me to really commit to him on a full-time basis. And, uh, you know, I thought about it and realized that, uh, you know, if uh, we took on this one-year program and succeeded, uh, that, you know, I'd like uh, to write a co-author a book with him, uh, which we ultimately did. Uh, and, of course, he knew he'd have my commitment because uh, if we did not succeed in this together, we would not have a story to tell. So, that was a great basis for establishing our mutual commitment. One of the things I really like about the book is how uh, Ken's leadership principles are applied uh, to this process. We really see that that come to light uh, on the third of these six principles where we talk about learning about situational leadership. Ken, let's, let's talk about this model that you and Tim applied to your f- fitness program. There's the three skills you need, the first of which is is goal setting. How do you go about setting goals, whether in the area of fitness or elsewhere in life? Well, you know, what you need with, with goals is you've got to make sure that they're not only tell you what area you want to work on, whether it's weight control or whatever, but you have an observable, measurable aspect of it because goals have to really kind of, you know, uh, mean something to uh, 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 to you, which you can observe and measure, and you can monitor the thing. So the key reason why goals are important is that you you need a different leadership style for different uh, goals. You know, you can't use the same style. A lot of people in the world of work make that mistake. They treat everybody the same, and uh, the reality is, in some aspects of their jobs, they might need direction or they might need coaching uh, or supporting and. They can't always handle a delegating leadership style, but so you, it's very task specific. That's why you got to set up the goals first. Yeah, and that's where we get into the whole aspect of diagnosing which, where you are, I guess, on the developmental process or in the developmental process, and determining which leadership style is right for you. What does that look like ultimately, Ken? There's four different development levels. One is the enthusiastic beginner. That's when you're excited about something, but you don't really have any skills or competency in it. And so uh, I found out in working with Tim that when it came to strength training and balance, I was an enthusiastic beginner because I had never lifted in my life Mm. and I never had worked on balance. I never thought that that was important. Although now I realize as I'm getting older, that that's the biggest problem with elderly people is falling and because of balance issues. So with enthusiastic beginner, you need a directing leadership style. With the other ones, except for sleep, where I was a self-directed achiever, which is the highest level of uh, development where you can handle delegating, I was what we call a disillusioned learner. Things are always more difficult than you thought, and that's when people usually drop out because they don't realize when you get a disillusioned, it's natural, uh, and now you need a coaching leadership style. You need both direction and uh, support, and hopefully if somebody coaches you through disillusionment, you become what we call capable but cautious. You've got the skills, but, you know, you need uh, cheerleading and all that kind of thing. And so, like, now I'm back with Weight Watchers in terms of my uh, weight control and nutrition because they're a great cheerleading operation because I know what I need to do now, and I'm uh, committed, but I still could use that encouragement and that kind of thing. And so that's where you get 
uh, first diagnosing, and then you can move to the next one, which is matching the appropriate leadership style. Tim, what role did going through this exercise play in bringing you and Ken to a point of breakthrough as far as Ken's fitness regimen is concerned? Uh, Jeff, I, I think as much as anything, it was uh, you know establishing uh, clear goals. As we talked about, that's the first part of the situational leadership. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, what we call the uh, the smart goals, you know, being uh, you know uh, starting out with very specific goals, and uh, what we had to do is is uh, divide that down and, and see what areas we really needed that in. And that's where we really kind of uh, looked at the what I consider the the six most important aspects of a healthy lifestyle, and then uh, to actually uh, analyze where Ken was on the scale, and as he'd indicated and. In the aerobic, he was probably at the D3 development level where uh, he knew what to do and how to do it. He just needed, uh, you know, the support. So I didn't have to be with him there, obviously, on the uh, exercise bike every day to be sure he did it. I just really, more than anything, just had to support him on it and tell him to do that. Uh, In the other areas, in terms of, like, strength training, uh, I know what happened in the past is uh, I would get him started, and and basically uh, he'd come through, and I'd take him through the – the exercises, and, and he would do what I said. And, of course, uh, after I left him, uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, he was at, at that point where he was, again, the disillusioned learner and, and not sure what to do. But so with this uh, here, uh, I was able to actually uh, advance him down the scale in uh, each of the areas that we talked about. And that's what was pretty exciting is to watch him go from an enthusiastic beginner to uh you know, in, in most cases, a self-reliant achiever where, you know, basically he knows what he needs to do and, and would go out and do that. So I think the uh, the magic of what we're doing here with the situational leadership model is uh, being able to advance through the developmental stages to where uh, you can really do the programs on your own, which is, you know, what uh, Ken got to a high, very high level in, in all six aspects. And and that, that's what ultimately led to the success that we've had. And I think that's what's unique about the book, Jeff. It's not a typical one where we actually tell you exactly what you have to do in all these areas. It's really about managing the journey so that people uh, can read this who are not working on their health but have another New Year's resolution, and they can use the whole concept to help them succeed. Mm. Excellent. Tim, uh, share with us why uh, principle four is so important, certainly with, with a fitness goal and developing age-appropriate goals. Uh, that's uh, probably the most, well, or at least one of the most important aspects in there, uh, Jeff, because I think we have to accept the fact that, uh, you know, as we go through the aging process, uh, physiologically our body changes and, and we can't do the things that uh, we once did. I I know I think uh, one of the uh, most common reasons for emergency room visits on weekends is the weekend warriors, uh, you know, the people in their uh, 40s 40s and even into their 50s that are behind a desk all week and think they can go out and play that that hard softball game on Saturday. Guilty. And uh, not realizing, uh, you know, that their their body doesn't recover like it used to. Uh, You know, physiologically we change and that, you know, our joints become less stable and and uh, just part of the aging process, uh, you know, we, we can't train exactly the same way. Uh, so the reality is uh, that we need to establish goals that are, are appropriate to where we are. Uh, if I consider where I am now in, in my 60s, and I look back, uh, you know, in, in my 20s, uh, the things that I could achieve then uh, and maintain, uh, you know, were very appropriate at that age. And if I try to do those now, I would I would fail. And I think... Uh, uh, people realize that uh, if they don't, uh, you know, make those changes, that you know they're they're not going to succeed. And as you get older, it's important that you work with a coach or a trainer who's very aware of the age uh, requirements and to set realistic goals. Because if you can't achieve the goals, then then you're really not going to succeed at what you want to do. For me, several years ago, it became immediately obvious that uh, I needed to set age-appropriate goals when I when I tried to do too much and tore my ACL, so I know that one all too well. Uh, exactly. Uh, principle five deals with the importance of, of setting up a support system to hold you accountable. We talked about having a commitment partner in principle two. How does this one differ from that? Well, it really means that uh, uh, you maybe not have one person in all of uh, the areas, but you might have people who are good at something. You might have a, a friend or a relative who's really 
good at their uh, weight control and nutrition, and they could really be a good partner uh, for you. You might have somebody else who's a, you know, been a jogger for a long time that can really help you in the aerobic area and all. It's really setting up the support system uh, that can not only give you direction and support as you need it, but is there to call you when you uh, seem to be lapsing and, and not following through. So uh, like my wife has a group of women she meets at 6, six o'clock in the morning three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. She's been doing it for years. And I tell you, some days she would get up and she would say, God, I would just roll over and go to sleep. But she's got a couple of ladies who are waiting for her. <laughs> and that's that support system and accountability. And that brings us to having measurable milestones to stay motivated. Principle six, what are some of the most common obstacles you two have seen people run up against when trying to stay motivated, whether it's uh, related to a fitness goal or uh, some other goal? Uh, I, th I think the most common thing that I would see there is that, uh, and it kind of ties in with the rest of this, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, usually uh, people have a tendency to set unrealistic goals. Uh, that New Year's resolution, as, as Ken talked about, uh, not being very successful, that people will say, you know what, uh, I want to lose 40 pounds. Um, and then, uh, you know, they don't really set a specific timeline or develop the, uh, the plan to get there. And so uh, I think in, when you establish the goals, it's important that it's not only realistic uh, and it's attainable, but that, uh, you know, you have uh, – you know, landmarks along the way. Uh, obviously, one of the measuring devices, which we don't think is the best, but it's a, it's a pretty good indicator, is the scale. And, you know, being able to, you know, if in six months' time your, your objective is to lose 25 pounds, is to be able to every month see that, you know, you're on progress, that you've uh, you know, lost those five pounds. And, and uh, if you do achieve losing those five pounds at the end of that first month, then there's cause to celebrate and be happy. And you can see if you've actually gained a pound or, or you've only lost two, it, it gives you a good indicator of, of how you need to, to readjust that. Uh, the other thing has to do with even as, as simple as a little more subjective is, you know, is how the clothes are feeling of having the objective of, I know people that uh, men who refuse to get rid of that uh, pair of 36 <laughs> pants because uh, they, they want to be sure that they can uh, get back into them. So, you know, if they're now in a 40 pants, obviously that sets a, a specific goal of being able to get into those. But the tape measure can help there and, and see, the, you know, the, through that process. But it, it's really important with that one to, to not only have a timeline to it, but to be able to have uh, the individual milestones and the markers along the way to be sure that you stay on track and that you can celebrate those successes or, or readjust the areas that are not as successful. I have a couple of questions I want to ask not related to the book, but before we move on to those, is there anything else you'd like to share about the book? Well, I think the big thing, Jeff, is to say to people, this book is just not about health. I mean, even though that's the focus, but it's good for anybody to read who has something that they want to accomplish in life and maybe they've had a struggle with it. This will give them a strategy because this book is is different. It's not just about a specific diet program and all. It's about that that journey. And so uh, that's what we're excited. We're getting a lot of good feedback where people are saying, wow, this really is giving me perspective on, on accomplishing some things that I've been failing on in the past. I think uh, my point there, Jeff, is this is not the magic pill in the sense of, uh, you know, the books that typically jump right out after January 1st every year, the ones that have the, uh, you know, the diet where you're going to lose 15 pounds in two weeks. And, and uh, you know, while these are a good idea, you'll notice that those, uh, there's a new diet every two weeks uh, that, that pops out uh, because we know that diets by themselves, you know, don't work. What we're talking about with this book is uh, lifestyle change. And the approach that we've taken to this is not just, uh, you know, saying that, you know, you have to quit everything good and, and do everything that's difficult, but it, it gives you that systematic process. And, and if you read the book, you can find out step by step how everybody at any age or any level can achieve that if, if they have the right plan in doing that. So our hope is that they'll read the book and realize that uh, it's not that difficult to make these changes and they're things that will really affect the rest of their lives. 
And Ken, to your point, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, the fact that these principles that I'm learning along the way can be applied to, to any goal you're looking to accomplish. But uh, also, for me specifically, I've had my eyes open to the concept that I've been interested in getting fit for a long time, but I've not been committed to the idea. So I'm excited to, to begin applying these principles to my own life uh, from a fitness standpoint as well here very, very soon. So thank you for that. Ken, uh, this next one is for you. Among all the leadership lessons you've come to espouse, if you had to narrow it down to uh, just one thing, what advice would you give? Well, I tell you, uh, the big thing I, I advise is that, remember, you can't always accomplish everything on your own. You get your ego out of the way mm. uh, and get the help. I think all of us need some mentors. All of us can be mentors to other people uh, so that... Uh, uh, I always say none of us is as smart as all of us, uh, and I think that's the big thing I would tell you is is stop you know thinking that you're John Wayne, uh, <laughs> you know, and riding off into the sunset. You know that you you probably need some help, and and uh, and all my work in industry, I'm telling people, you know, help people win at work. You know, give them the help that they need. Just don't set goals and then disappear, and then see all in when they haven't accomplished the goals and make a lot of noise and dump on them and then fly out. You remind me of what uh, our last week's guest, Liz Weissman, says in her book, Multipliers. It's not how much you know, it's it's how much access you have to what other people know. It's leveraging the collective brain power around you. Would you say that's similar to what you, you're describing? Yes, and uh, Liz spoke at our uh, uh, company conference last year. She's mm. fabulous, and that's that's so important was uh, how do you bring out the brain power around you? Because if organizations would utilize their people rather than thinking all the brains are in the top management mm. uh, office, uh, they do so much better. Well, this one's for both of you. At the end of the day, what do you hope your legacy to be? Well, I think uh, mine, I, I guess I would uh, you know, like to think that uh, I would be remembered as a uh, you know, uh, being a, a good leader, uh, teacher, and coach, uh, and in the aspect of the situational leadership on the side of, you know, of providing the, the direction, the coaching, the uh, the support, and the, the delegation that I did that uh, effectively uh, with raising my kids and uh, as a teacher, uh, you know, working with people uh, and uh, as a coach, uh, helping people I can. And I think more than anything, uh, it kind of ties in with what I absolutely love doing, and that's, uh, you know, helping people make themselves better. So I think more than anything, I'd just like to remember, be remembered as somebody who really contributed to that. I think, uh, Jeff, for me, I'd like to be remembered as a, a teacher and example of simple truths. I've uh, spent my career trying to find, to take the complicated and make it simple. And the reason I'm excited about this book, I finally went, duh. <laughs> How come I'm not taking those simple concepts and applying it to myself mm. in my own uh, journey in this particular one in health? But uh, so that uh, I want to be remembered as the teacher and example of simple truths. Another one for the two of you. I'd love to know a couple of books in that this is a podcast that uh, encourages uh, intentional and consistent reading. A couple of books the last few years that have had an impact on you and how or why they impacted you as they did. Well, I can say a, a couple that come to mind. Uh, most recently, uh, probably, is, is uh, the book The Lone Survivor, which, uh, as you know, just came out and, and uh, as, a, as a major movie. And uh, I think the impact that book had on me as much as anything is uh, uh, looking at the, in the book in particular, uh, the first half of the book really talks about the uh, very intensive training uh, that you go through uh, as a, a Navy to become a Navy SEAL. And it's probably some of the most uh, tasking, grueling things that you could do. So having to really dig into your inner self uh, to, you know, actually achieve that goal. But also in uh, learning the importance of working as a team and how you can't do this all by yourself and, and that, that you need that help. And, and in the second part of the book uh, and in the movie, when they actually – he does become uh, a, a Navy SEAL that uh, you don't ever, I don't think SEALs ever work uh, as an individual. They always work in teams. Mm. 
and uh, you know, with teams, they support each other in, in every regard, and they coach and teach each other, and and uh, they they the successes that they do have. Uh, unfortunately, the the story has a very sad ending, but it, it I think it does show how you know, at least in the spirit, we can persevere in doing that. And probably along the same lines, the other book that comes to mind that I I keep rereading is. Uh, uh, one the the book was called uh, the endurance and it was written by um, or there was a story actually of, of Ernest, Ernest Shackleton in 1914 who took 28 men uh, on an expedition to uh, the Antarctic to try to cross the uh, the Antarctic be the first team to do that and they get trapped in uh, ice mm. and they don't even make it uh, onto the mainland there and uh, the leadership that uh, Shackleton has got to uh, take all of these uh, 28 men through uh, over the next 18 month period, and the fact that they all survived, and the only reason they survived is because uh, of the fact that they all had to work together uh, as a team. So obviously, I'm, I'm inspired by uh, leadership, and really inspired by by teamwork. Ken, how about you? Well, uh, I reread every year uh, the Power of Positive Thinking. I got to work with Norman Vincent Peale, but it came out in 52, and it still applies. Mm. I think uh, uh, we have a lot of stinking thinking uh, <laughs> that we put in our heads and put ourselves down, and I think that thinking positively and also taking action is really a powerful thing, and so I always do that. And then uh, Jim Collins' work, I think, has been really great. You know, he wrote Good to Great and Why to, uh, you know, Great Companies of Fall, and uh, uh, it just reinforces uh, some of the thinking and work that I've done over the years. You know, the Jim's a firm believer that great leaders have a both-and attitude towards results and people. That, you know, it's not just about Wall Street and get that stock price and do this. It is that your number one customer is really your people. And if you take care of your people and motivate and train and empower them, they'll go out of their way to take care of your customers and they'll want to come back. And uh, that'll take care of your bottom line. So uh, that's just a, always a reinforcer for me. Well, before we wrap up, I'd love to know what's on the horizon for the two of you. Any projects independently that you're working on that you want others to know about? Well, I'm working on a fun project right now with Mort Shavitz, who is the head of the Department of Psychiatry at, at uh, UC San Diego. The working title is Refire, Don't Retire. And <laughs> when I was... 65, I was on the phone with my friend Zig Ziglar, who died just uh, recently, and uh, he had invited my wife and I to the 59th anniversary of his 21st birthday, and and I said, Zig, are you going to retire? He said, there's no mention of it in the Bible, except for <laughs> Jesus, Mary, and David, a couple of other people. Nobody under 80 made an impact. He said, I'm refiring, <laughs> not retiring, and I just thought, my God, if we had refirement homes rather than retirement, you go to retirement homes. Looks like everybody's sitting around at dinner waiting to die mm. rather than somebody grabbing the microphone and saying the discussion question for the night is. <laughs> and uh, so this is a fun project about uh, uh, making the rest of your life the best of your life, not just for senior citizens, but everybody. About We need to refire intellectually, physically, emotionally with our relationships and spiritually. Ken has obviously been a real uh, inspiration to me and being able to take uh, – what's kind of been my life work, life works and, and, uh, put it into, to print. So, uh, I'm just anxious to get out there. I'm actually, uh, presenting to a group of our uh, local community, uh, here tomorrow. They, uh, the, the fit at last, uh, concept, uh, here that we're talking about today. And I'm very excited to do that and very anxious to get the, uh, the word out and, and being a, a new, uh, author, uh, excited to see what is on the horizon. I'm I'm ready at this point. I'm I'm taking uh, Ken's advice and I'm I'm not retiring. I'm refiring. So uh, I'm anxious to see what's ahead. And if that means more uh, writing projects or speaking projects, I'm I'm ready and, and anxious to take it on. Well, the book again is Fit at Last: Look and Feel Better Once and for All by Ken Blanchard and Tim Kieran. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of the Read to Lead podcast. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's been great being with you. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed today's conversation and would like to win my personal review copy of Fit at Last, Look and Feel Better Once and for All, all you need to do is go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash 031. 
Just click the tweet that is uh, linked for you there and then hit send and you are officially entered to win my very own copy of Fit at Last. If you'd like to connect with Ken or Tim or both on Twitter or let them know what you thought about today's episode, you can reach Tim on Twitter at Tim Karen. That's at Tim K-E-A-R-I-N on Twitter. And Ken is simply at Ken Blanchard, B-L-A-N-C-H-A-R-D, at Ken Blanchard on Twitter. I'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher or both. Simply go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes to leave a review there or readtoleadpodcast.com slash Stitcher. I want to say special thanks to Jennifer Wilcox, John Cramp of the Riverstone Group, right in my own backyard. They do great things at the riverstonegroup.com. And also georgecow.com. That's George K A O. Dot com. Thanks to each and every one of you for your five-star ratings and reviews. I really appreciate it. Finally, don't forget that tentative programming note. I hesitate to share a programming note that's tentative, but there's an outside chance that there will not be a Read to Lead podcast episode next week, February 6th. That does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time on the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com and chat with other members at facebook.com slash readtoleadnation. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. you want to say let the words fall out honestly honestly baby did you want to say let the words fall out honestly See